Welcome everyone to the Global Education Colloquium. Um, we're very excited today to be welcoming Dr. Felisa Tibbetts from TC, the Teachers College at Columbia <laughs> University. My name is Christy Kelly and I'm a faculty member here at Drexel University in the School of Education. Um, Dr. Tibbetts is going to be talking about some really interesting research she's been working on with UNESCO. Um, the title of her talk today is Riding the Wave, Human Rights Education Within the World Culture of UNESCO's Global Citizenship Education. Dr. Tibbetts is a lecturer in the Comparative and International Education Program at Teachers College, Columbia University. Her research interests include peace, human rights, and democratic citizenship education, as well as curriculum policy and reform, critical pedagogy, and education and social movements. She was a Fulbright Fellow at Lund University in Sweden during fall 2014, and a Human Rights Fellow at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University between 2011 and 2013. Dr. Tibbetts has published practical resources on curriculum, program development, and evaluation on behalf of UNESCO, um, UNICEF, uh, the UN Commissioner for Human Rights, the OSCODIHR, which I apologize for not even knowing what this acronym means, <laughs> and the Council of Europe and non-government organizations such as Amnesty International and the Open Society Foundations. Dr. Tibbetts is widely read in Journal of Human Rights Education and her scholarship, I'm sorry, in the field of human rights education, and her scholarship has appeared in numerous books and journals, including Journal of Peace Education, Intercultural Education Prospects, and the International Review of Education. Um, I'm especially excited to be welcoming Dr. Tibbetts because she's also the co-founder of the NGO Human Rights Education Associates, which is a fabulous resource um, for people interested in human rights education. She directed this from 1999 to 2011 and co-founded HER USA branch version. She received her bachelor's degree and two master's degrees in public policy and education from Harvard and her doctorate in political science from the Otto von Gurek Universität of Magdeburg. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds okay. good. Sounds no, good. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome, Dr. Timmons. We're so excited to have you here today. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Christy. Thank you all. It's a pleasure to, um, to be here at Drexel. I've been reading about Drexel actually for some time and I had um, a few minutes to spend with uh, Dr. Kelly before we came here, and I'm really excited actually about the research she's doing. So um, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to present on some work. Um, this Actually, this presentation is distilled from work that I have been doing with IBE UNESCO. Um, and uh, as Dr. Kelly has said, my interests and my passion, my vocation has been in human rights education. And um, from that perspective, I've entered some work with UNESCO in relation to their Global Citizenship Education Initiative. So what I'd like to do today, it's a bit ambitious, um, but I hope that it'll work. Uh, these are the topics I intend to address. Um, I will be happy to go into greater depth on anything that I present that you'd like me to go back to. I know we have some time for that. So first of all, I want to touch a little bit on theories of global citizenship, very lightly on global citizenship education and human rights education, which are separate approaches but are intersecting it's in some ways around SDG 4.7. So I want to talk also about some of these, uh, global, uh, these global initiatives regarding education that are very pertinent now. UNESCO has a very important role to play in global citizenship education as a part of GCED and Education 2030, so I want to touch on that and then move right into measurement because obviously when we're thinking about cross-national efforts in global citizenship education uh, as uh, is required by SDG 4.7 Education 2030, we have to wonder, well, how will that measurement take place? And that's really where we're going to get into sort of the, um, the sort of the the thick content of my presentation today, looking at some of the indicators that UNESCO has themselves elaborated and which I applied in carrying out some work with them um, last year and reflecting on a few uh, interesting case studies to sort of illustrate or reveal some of the challenges about global citizenship education as it's been conceived and now being measured by UNESCO and human rights education as a, a singular approach and, and its intersections with all of this. So I want to first begin with by sort of disclosing some of my working assumptions. Um, and I'm not sure if I can move here, so I'm going to move thinking that, okay, <laughs> I'm not sure why. Oh, you can still see me. Um, 
So one of the things I wanted to begin with is just a few assumptions. I mean, uh, if you've been looking at Global Citizen to Education, I know some of you um, that are listening have already been looking at this. I mean, my goodness, there's lots of different definitions, there's different models, there's critiques that there is work being done that actually doesn't take into account theoretical approaches. I'm not really going to get into that. And my apologies if that's something that interests you. I'm just going to begin with the assumption that um, it's possible to think about having identities that are multiple, that they're, and they're intersecting, so they can coexist, so I don't think it's an either or in terms of thinking of uh, uh, identity as a citizen and uh, of your community, country, and also internationally. Um, I do want to recognize, and again, a bit of a simplification, but I think it's pertinent for at least my presentation today, two very distinct approaches within global citizenship education, and there are many, many different approaches. One is thinking about global citizenship education as promoting global consciousness. Um, and, and this is a kind of approach that really focuses on global citizenship education, promoting education for social responsibility and critical consciousness. And I'm going to illustrate what this might mean um, um, from UNESCO's own uh, policy documents and also measurement indicators. There's another approach uh, we can say that's distinct, uh, which is a focus on global competencies. This notion that education for global citizenship should uh, result in learners having competencies that will allow them to basically participate and potentially compete in global processes. Now, it's not necessarily the case that these approaches won't be coexisting within a global citizenship education approach, but, they're, but their aims and purposes are a bit different. And I think in regards to human rights, um, and human rights education, it's important to keep these distinctions in mind. So now I'm going to move sideways and talk a little bit about human rights education. Um, there is a growing theoretical consensus um, for those of us who are doing research and theorizing or trying to do theorizing in human rights education that it's really important to reassert human rights education's transformative potential. Um, I would uh, as a background for human rights education practice, as someone who's been involved in it for decades now, my own um, awareness as, uh, about its history has, um, is that on the one hand we have a, a kind of legal literacy route to human rights education, to human rights education based on basically knowing the, the pertinent laws or national protection systems where you live so that you can access justice, you can claim your rights vis-a-vis -vis these laws, policies, and practices. Um, but there's also another route for human rights education that's not a legal literacy route, but one that's related to popular education, resistance education. So if we think about Latin America and NGOs and their work in resistance using the human rights uh, frame, that's another uh, deep route for human rights education. And le the legal literacy and the sort of popular education roots of what would be a human rights education field came together, I think, in the 1980s. And, um, and because it's become more popularized, if you will, HRE, although I can't say it's terribly mainstream, but it has become more popularized, we're finding that some of the roots that have to do with popular education, this notion that human rights uh, education proposes a critique of society, a critique of governments, that element can sometimes be lost. So the theoreticians, including Monisha Bajaj, Andre Kate, myself, and others, um, have been trying to assert uh, or reassert the importance of human rights education promoting a critical stance um, in regards to power in all its forms and different levels, and moreover, this notion that human rights education should be uh, promoting uh, transformative actions, whether they're in the private domain, domain personal domain, or more public uh, related to, um, so, um, say for example, uh, law-related um, uh, platforms, laws, policies, and so forth, duty bearers as they're called. So um, in an effort to reassert this, there's even um, uh, some theor theoreticians are proposing not to even call it human rights education, but critical human rights education. And similar to that, this notion of calling it a transformative human rights education, but it's basically the same aim, to make sure um, that the transformative, emancipatory approach to human rights education is retained. This is really clearly related to the global consciousness approach to um, global citizenship education. And associated with all this is also critical pedagogy, and um, I'm not going to go into further detail about this, but just to recognize that those of us who are really invested in human rights education are really um, committed to this kind of uh, approach. It means, for example, not merely learning about certain human rights like the international uh, human rights framework and 
the contents, all as important as those are, of course, but recognizing that the pedagogy, how you use that or apply that information um, when you introduce it is also very, very important in terms of having human rights be relevant for people's personal lives and local communities. So it's not just thinking about international processes, but thinking about human rights as a values framework, a critical framework for looking at power, injustice, discrimination in the environment immediately around you. So let's now turn to Global Citizens of Education and UNESCO. Um, as if you've been looking at UNESCO's work over the years, you probably already know that their frame for education is already thinking about education as a human right. So the rights language is very much one that the, it's a lens that they're already using. Of course, Global Citizenship Education as an initiative is one of their strategic areas now for the period 2014-2021. It's guided simultaneously by the Sustainable Development Goal 4.7, uh, which I'll uh, elaborate on in the next slide, and the Education 2030 Framework for Action, FFA, which is a, a successor to um, basically um, education for all. So Education 2030 is about quality education, it's access to education, quality education, and SDG 4.7 is within the SDGs related to quality education, but focused on some of these approaches like education for sustainable development, global citizenship education, and also on human rights education. Um, the Global Citizenship Education Initiative, which is the strategic area of, the, of UNESCO's work, uh, obviously um, the intention is to influence practice. So although measurement is one of the uh, concerns, um, but frankly, it's as, as with other work that the UN does, the idea is, is to remind states and to assist states in um, carrying out uh, schooling in this case that's reflective of uh, values, in this case related to global citizenship education. So they really want them to be concretely some changes in curriculum and other kinds of related changes in education systems so that in this case global citizenship is stronger. So it's curricular changes, teacher training, related assessment and so forth, textbooks and so forth. So um, one of the things to recognize about UNESCO, it's not an easy job they have because on the one hand um, UNESCO uh, is promoting these ideals of say, global citizenship education, and historically also peace education, Holocaust education, human rights education, education for sustainable development. So they have these very aspirational goals around these approaches that are really, um, they're value-centered and oriented towards critical consciousness and social transformation. At the same time, they have to work very pragmatically with all states. Member states have different uh, levels of interest in these various uh, uh, domains, including global citizenship education. They have their own value systems, which may or may not be closely related to human rights education, for example, um, or peace education. So they have to work pragmatically in terms of giving them technical assistance and offering them guidelines. So on the one hand, it's aspirational. On the other hand, they have to work very pragmatically um, with ministries of education. So this is a challenge for sure. Now their approach to global citizenship education I think has evolved a little bit over the last few years and this is relevant background for the research that I did with them. So on the one hand in 2014 when the global citizenship education initiative was being elaborated by UNESCO they came out with a, uh, a publication um, that really was uh, aspirational and they had um, recognized, and I'm focusing now, and I'm going to start zeroing in on human rights, it recognized human rights as a part of their wider frame for global citizenship education. And here you see language like transformative pedagogy, very similar to human rights education, critical human rights education, transformative human rights education. It's more this human, humanistic approach. So you can see all the sort of values here that they have incorporated under global citizenship education, which became a kind of frame for a lot of these related approaches. One of the things that's true, I think, for UNESCO's work um, historically has been that they sometimes, I think, on the, on the, on the heels of having you know, the opportunity to pursue a particular initiative because, frankly, there's funding, they might make a frame like peace education or ESD or global citizenship education, and within that, subsume these related, so-called related approaches that are also very humanistic and oriented towards uh, peaceful, just societies. So in terms of global citizenship education here, we see underneath the human rights, peace ed basically, sustainable development, just like for SDG uh, 4.7, we see education for sustainable development as the frame, and inside of that, you find global citizenship education, human rights, peace, and so forth. So this is, I think it's more politics, 
but the substance is fairly fairly similar. But in the 2014 document, we really saw transformative pedagogy. I remember being struck by that. Um, but by 2015, UNESCO was working to get something much more concrete um, out there, so they can be. And this was basically themes and learning objectives. So this was moving from basically a policy document, a white paper, 2014, to something much more uh, able to be used as technical assistance for countries. So they worked with some consultants and came up with a kind of framing paradigm. Um, of course, using knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes. This is the kind of you know ways in which we think about trying to influence. Um, you know, um, uh, competency-based curriculums, which most countries have, well, not all, but most do. So you have these learning objectives. And these learning objectives were organized, I mean, there's a lot, lot more. You can easily find these UNESCO documents, so I, I'm really oversimplifying, but um, I'm not misrepresenting. This is sort of the kinds of topics that you would find in the 2015 document. And it's very interesting. So on the one hand, we have content related to global systems and structures, but recognizing sort of multi-level approach. Um, this notion of interaction and connectedness of communities, again, at multiple levels. Power dynamics, very interesting, uh, as a part of global citizens of education topics, um, eligible to be included in the curriculum. The notion of multiple and different levels of identities, again, interconnectedness, diversity, very strong, actually. Um, thinking about taking actions um, both individually and collectively, you can see, and then ethically responsible behavior, again, taking action. There's some overlap here. But this gives you a sense of the kinds of topics that you found in this guidelines, the 2015 guidelines. Now, in 2016, IBE, which, as you may know, is the International Bureau of Education, this is in Geneva. It's not in the headquarters of Paris, in, uh, headquarters of UNESCO, which is in Paris. And IBE is focused on curriculum and textbooks. So in order to contribute to the Global Citizenship Education Initiative, IBE decided to do a study, in this case a 10 country study last year, which looked um, at the status of GCED um, as it is currently represented in key curriculum and textbooks. They selected 10 countries. I do not know why these countries were selected. I know in part they were selected because they agreed <laughs> to <laughs> present their information to UNESCO and to have it there, um, to have it analyzed. Um, and I'm certain that this is a precursor for UNESCO's being better prepared um, to offer technical assistance to these countries and in the future around GCED, right? Because again, if you were gonna have an initiative like Global Citizenship Education, the rubber hits the road with curriculum, and national curriculum in particular. So, um, so this was, there's a 10 country study and the way they decided to approach this particular study, since GCED, as you can see, is very wide. You've got peace, you've got human rights, you've got ESD, Education for Sustainable Development. What they decided is they were going to um, focus in on the distinction between what might be considered kind of traditional civics or citizenship education and global citizenship education. Again, but working off of a kind of a narrower frame. I'll give you, I'll show you the indicators that were used. So they weren't going to be looking for indications of peace ed, so-called, or HRE, per se, but they were going to be trying to look at something around a frame that would be more traditional civics and citizen education like, but lifting up to the global level. And they added a bit more to that. Um, there was, um, as you might expect, they were going to be looking for curriculum outcomes or content that pertain to you know, uh, cognitive knowledge, content knowledge, are trying to influence attitudes as well as behaviors of students. So this was, um, so this study was carried out and is published, by the way. And I wanted to show you the kinds of indicators they used because when I became involved, it wasn't, uh, it was after the 10 country study. While they were finishing up this report, they wanted um, a more in-depth look at a few countries. And that's where I came in to do a curriculum analysis. I used these indicators which is why I'm presenting them. And I also think, again, it's very interesting. How is UNESCO going to be thinking about trying to measure global citizenship education? I mean, this is a big discussion, of course, that um, I'm not presenting to you around how to try to capture, uh, how to develop indicators related to the sustainable development goals in general that are reasonable and feasible for countries across the world to collect data on. Um, UNESCO has a very, uh, uh, a very, um, respectable uh, number of curriculum uh, that they've been collecting over the years for countries. So UNESCO is also sorting out through IBE how they might, by looking at curriculum they have, 
on file and that they might continue to collect, uh, how they might look at intended curriculum as a way to measure uh, the SDG 4.7, right? Making sense so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if the problems when you're concentrating are just like <laughs> <laughs> not making any sense at all. <laughs> okay. So this is important for UNESCO's trying to contribute to the discussion on measurement related to you know um, ESD, uh, uh, which is 4.7, um, which they've also now linked with global citizenship education. And it's also a way for them to think about how they might get technical assistance, so multiple purposes. They're trying to move fast because it's really moving fast now with SDGs. So the, the, the indicators that were developed, I didn't develop these indicators, I just used them in part. These indicators showed there, um, there were 22 distinct indicators that UNESCO decided to apply in this 10 country study. One was very, something very interesting, justification and general orientations about GCED. In other words, really looking for curriculum that somehow self-identified as being related to global citizenship, right? Self-identifying. And this could be in different ways. It could be looking at global citizenship in a sort of socio-economic way, um, which would be more neoliberal, um, more political. I guess it would be looking at international processes. I'll give you some examples. Cultural and moral, it's a bit vague. And I have to say, I think they, they didn't find many examples of this, um, but they recognize there were different, here are the different domains potentially of global citizenship education, which I mentioned earlier in, uh, as I started this presentation. So they looked for the general orientation language about GCED. Then they looked at uh, various content domains. I think these are the only ones I have, yeah. So they looked for indications that the curriculum, and in some cases the textbooks, actually um, referenced global systems, structures, and processes. Uh, they could be global governance, um, that could mean financial institutions, by the way, um, but also the United Nations, obviously. Human rights law, so here I'm, or I'm lifting out now the human rights piece. Transnational corporations, very interesting. So that's one of the content areas they look for evidence of. Second O is also global issues. And again, some of these are critical issues, like North-South relations, global poverty, genocide, refugees, etc. Globalization from a critical perspective, climate change. So these are some of the contents that they were looking for um, as representative of GCED. Attitudinally in that domain of this notion of having multiple identities, very important. So looking at multiple identities, but also not looking at them just within the country, but looking at identities, again, at the local and the and national and potentially um, international level, perhaps regional as well. Um, and also it's very, very important here, um, attitudinally speaking, that that there was some indication that the curriculum and learning materials promoted differences and respect for diversity. There is a law here. Um, so, and again, intercultural education, multicultural education, huge field in and of itself, um, but not only information, but also attitudes to try to promote empathy, dialogue, um, respect, um, non-discrimination, awareness of racism, and so forth. So it was really not so thin. Can yeah. I you the question? Sure. I'm just wondering, so this coding scheme, is this primarily just for the textbooks? It wouldn't affect any other part of the curriculum, or? No, it was looking at like national curriculum standards. So when, when they looked at, well, when I applied it myself, I used a wider frame. They looked, for example, they typically looked in the 10 country study at civics curriculum, social studies curriculum, looked just at social sciences. Whereas when I applied these to the countries I studied, I looked at education laws, I looked at um, curriculum frameworks, you know, it depends on which country, whether it's a national curriculum framework or not. Um, I also looked at um, any curriculum that was eligible to be included. I looked at, for example, moral education curriculum in Cambodia. I looked at, if anything like civics, I could get my hands to history education. So I looked more interdisciplinary. Um, and I looked, um, I did look at one textbook, but I tended to look, just look at standards. So, um, so that's, but they were looking more, more narrowly so that they could actually do something more comparative. Looking at the equivalent of civics or citizenship education, in some cases it was called like, you know, society and you know, man and society instead of being coherent. So, but mine was wider, it's okay. Um, so you can see, get an idea here, in behavioral domains, again, very clear what you might expect from UNESCO and this notion of active citizenship, which is what they were thinking about. So engagement, and evidence that there were goals and actual learner goals and thematic content related to engagement, participation, action, including on global issues. I mean, already, if you've been, any of you have been looking at citizenship education in any country context, it's always a challenge to find evidence of this, but also to lift that up also to the global level. So very ambitious. 
Um, but these were the indicators that were developed for use again on this narrow study that I applied. Now, um, in terms of human rights education, which is what I wanted to focus on with you, we have to add another degree of difficulty, if you will. And that is that human rights education, the gold standard, is not just about, about content of human rights. And we, uh, I worked on some standards with the OSCE ODIR on guidelines for human rights education in secondary schools. And believe me, there is a lot one could learn about human rights that's very content-centered, like the United Nations and how it works, the international human rights framework, specific frameworks like the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and so forth, um, how um, the human rights mechanisms work. There's no question. There's a whole legal background there that's quite um, that's eligible to be considered part of human rights education. But getting back to this notion of transformative human rights education or critical human rights education, human rights education, the gold standard is that it should also be through human rights, meaning that, it, that when you're learning about human rights, it's in an environment that's democratic, that's participatory, that's respectful of everybody in the room, learners and teachers alike. Um, so there's a human rights culture, if you will, in the room, although we could unpack that a bit, but also that it, the praxis that it's aimed towards taking action. So the gold standard of human rights education, and this is in the, um, the Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training, uh, which came out in, at the end of 2011, is very much a critical and transformative approach that I mentioned earlier. Human rights education in the classroom should be about, through, and for human rights. The UN really feels that unless you're moving towards learner empowerment, unless it's moving people, at least in their dispositions, to be interested to make a difference. Because not everyone's going to be wanting to or able to go out on the streets. It depends on your environment. But if they're not in somehow moved by that experience, it's not successful. So this is the gold standard. It's a, it's a gold standard even in non-formal education, perhaps a particular challenge for schools, depending on how they uh, envision their own role in regards to um, preparing learners to participate in society, okay? So this is another kind of, uh, as I said, a, a barrier, if you will, or a, a, a consideration when we look at human rights and human rights education within global citizens of education. So I just wanted to mention this. So here are some of the results of the 10 country study. Then we'll get to my part, okay? Let me see how we're doing for time here. I think we're doing, can I keep on going? We're good? Okay. So, um, so, now, mind you, the Global Citizenship Education Initiative, it's young now. It's just, you know, the UNESCO just came out with their, their, their thematic content and goals just a couple of years ago. So there wasn't an expectation that the countries, many of them would be really sort of far along. But anyway, so one of the results was that there was a general absence in terms of human rights. This is my interest. General absence of direct references to human rights and human rights education. I mean, this is not surprising. Um, there were kind of related, human rights related themes and content, like the values of non-discrimination, much more, um, I think that was fairly consistent, you could find those. And sometimes you could find evidence of um, participation, but it's like, it's very rare that we saw human rights or human rights education um, across the 10 country study. There was a predominance of a state-centered approach. Again, remind you, this is, was looking specifically at civics and citizenship education-related curriculum. It wasn't looking in an interdisciplinary way at a curriculum. Um, there's a predominance of a state-centered approach and a neutral presentation of global institutions and processes. And that's important because if we think about North-South issues and globalization and who benefits and who um, does not benefit, I mean, there are there's many ways that one could be critical, critically thinking about global processes, even the digital, you know, the digital divide. These are really um, very common concerns now, and we didn't see that present in, uh, in, the, um, in the 10 country study. Uh, so there was clearly a kind of, because of the, the very thin references to human rights that we found, um, that were explicit human rights, I would say, you could say there was a, a, a really a, a clear gap between a critical or transformative human rights education um, that's supported by the theorists, those of us that are there. <laughs> it's not like a wide field, but we're there. And sort of the world culture of global citizenship, which again, which is not really critical per se. Um, although, again, the earlier UNESCO documents suggested as such, but when we started getting down to the brass tacks, we didn't see that quite as much, okay? Another issue around indicators, and of course there are people that look at this all the time, is that if we're thinking about human rights education and the practice is important, that would never be captured in indicators. 
So this is already going to be a problematic of sorts. Anyway, so um, I'm going to move now to the case studies that I did. Um, I looked at Cambodia, Mongolia, and Uganda. I threw in New Jersey. I did, and it's funny now. It sounds like a joke. But I thought, hey, I really want to pick a sort of different, something, something from the West. And I knew that New Jersey had been working on global citizenship education. I thought, well, it might be kind of a best case. Let's just see what they're doing. So I know it's sort of funny, isn't it? But um, <laughs> so what I was asked to do is on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the tail of the 10 country study to look uh, more deeply at these three of these countries. New Jersey is not a country. I'm also working. Um, to see really what, you know, again, evidence of GCED and really dig in more deeply. And so what I did is I looked at, as I mentioned, I looked at um, any um, education laws that might be relevant. Uh, um, in some cases, I looked at constitutions um, because sometimes there was some reference to the role of education relating to democratization and human rights, or potentially there could be. Uh, I looked at any national curriculum frameworks. I looked at frameworks for subjects that seemed eligible to be linked with global citizenship education. So that could include the kind of civics or citizenship education kind of curriculum that had been looked at in the 10 country study, but also in some places they had something called like moral education, rallies education. I mean, and I will say right now that, um, that <laughs> skipping ahead, um, that I didn't have access to all the curriculum. I mean, UNESCO worked really, really hard getting these materials. Um, not all the materials that were available were able to be translated into English. I had access to many, many materials that, I mean, I, everything UNESCO could get, get their hands on basically gave to me. Plus I did other kinds of, I did a literature review, I, did, I looked for scholarly uh, scholarship that would um, also be relevant, also to see maybe think about it historically. So um, all of the places, I'm, I am calling call New Jersey a country for now, okay? <laughs> All the, 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 the four case studies I looked at did make specific references to international governance systems. And usually that was the United Nations and international human rights standards. So what I found is if I looked at across these various different uh, samples of curriculum, that I did find what I would call minimal content uh, that was human rights related. However, what was interesting is that the positionality of the countries um, uh, and I'll get into more details, tend to be focusing just on the content issues. So you didn't have attention to pedagogy that I would call human rights education or critical pedagogy or praxis. But you did find some minimal here about human rights. This is not surprising. Other studies on the presence of human rights in schooling have found that this is a predisposition towards content. Um, but what's interesting is Uganda alone did reference um, an economic dimension of globalization processes in wanting to develop a beneficial relationship with international partners. So what was really interesting is, um, is that, as I looked at these very small sample of cases, how their orientations towards a globalization differed. So we had from Uganda, um, the only mention of international uh, processes was in regard to basically financial relationships. So we might call it global competencies oriented. And New Jersey alone was the only case example I looked at that referenced global issues such as poverty and genocide, which you might call global consciousness. And what I'm sharing with you today, by the way, obviously it's a very small sample. It's more, I think, for me, revealing issues that would um, lead you to do further, further research. Why is it that New Jersey, a very globalized, if you will, curriculum, is focusing on these more uh, consciousness and critical consciousness as opposed to global processes, which the United States is obviously a very important um, part of. So um, just a curiosity there. Um, all of the curriculum I looked at included values related to respect for diversity, basically humanistic values. I mean, schools do that, so that's not surprising. Um, typically, though, not surprising at this point, often it was kind of within a national frame. So not surprising. I mean, if you, are, you, know, if you see the role of schooling as, as promoting social cohesion and coexistence, then um, to the degree you have diversity, you might be working with um, members of your immediate community or across the country. So there was generally an absence of a reference to global values and processes, excepting, again, New Jersey. <laughs> um, none of the um, examples I looked at um, included curriculum encouraging taking action on global issues. And one of the things I really would like to do more research on myself is to think about 
about actually privilege and how um, a, a new, like one of the explanations might be that New Jersey sees itself uh, in, in, in comparison to some of these other countries as, uh, as, as um, positioned as, uh, in a position of privilege. So participation in global issues is not unfathomable, you know. You know, you've, it's a, it's a, there's an internationalization already that's happening in New Jersey. There's, I mean, learners go abroad. There, I don't know. It's interesting to think about basically positionality internationally and how that might influence interest in referencing global issues and our orientations towards it. Um, generally speaking, if we, I did find a reference to human rights or human rights education. Getting back to my original question. Um, if it was in the national curriculum, it was it tended to be subsumed within a pre pre existing dominant moral or civic education framework. This was super interesting for me uh, because I hadn't been looking as much at this in the past. So I want to give you a few examples of this, and then I'll have I'll be wrapping up. So um, so for Cambodia, I looked at the social studies grades one through nine. And I also looked at their moral and civics uh, curriculum, which is the upper level. Well, interesting enough, because in China, like moral education is younger. But in this case, they had something called social studies for basic ed, and then 10, 12 was moral civics education. And in fact, in Cambodia, the most pronounced value theme of GCED was human rights. Very interesting. It tended to emerge um, within social studies, beginning already with grade four, and included topics like children's rights, gender and human rights, examples of international human rights law, Buddhism and human rights, which I'll get back to. Um, what was interesting is that as I looked across the different curriculum, it seemed to me that all these sort of values orientation, even, even if it included um, references to human rights, was kind of under this general ethos of what constituted good behavior and rights and responsibilities. Well, it tended to be within a kind of frame of you are a good citizen, this is how you should behave. Um, so it wasn't promoting sort of individual agency or critical thinking, but sort of more socializing approach. Um, and in a sense, I think that the human rights was a supplement to the moral and religious codes incorporated already within social studies. So I looked specifically, there was actually um, a unit um, on Buddhism and human rights, and I thought, wow, what's, what's that look like? So I looked at that a little bit more closely, and again, it was much more kind of a socializing framework in regards to Buddhist principles. Um, and the presumption would also be that the human rights framework was already consistent with Buddhist principles. Now, if you're a human rights educator activist and you're trying to get human rights in national curriculum, you might say, this is great. We're going to look for values overlap between human rights values, humanistic secular values, and say Buddhism or Christianity or Islam or what have you as a kind of way of showing how human rights is not antithetical to existing value systems. On the other hand, you therefore risk reducing human rights just to values, um, which means you leave out the critical perspective, the notion of state accountability. This is one of the issues around getting human rights in schools. It's always kind of a bit of a challenge. Um, so that was one of the revealing features of just, again, looking at human rights through GCE uh, analysis. Now, in Uganda, I looked at the education sector strategic plan. Um, no mention of human rights there. Um, they were revising it, and you did find it twice, just in text. I know they're planning to infuse more human rights. Uh, but at the time, all the documents I had, there was actually no presence of human rights within the curricular aims or as an explicit content of Ugandan social studies. Again, I'm focusing on human rights as part of GCED. Um, but it did show up. Human rights concerns showed up within the civics curriculum. And it was linked with national development and problems related to the rule of law. And this was a really cool thing to see. So I want to tell you about this. So the traditional civics approach in Uganda is actually a bit non-traditional, because they, there's not a, a, there was implicitly an understanding that the rule of law and good governance didn't always um, work uh, as it should. So. Um, under the topic of leaders in our district, because I really was looking to see what I could find, you found there was, a, there was a brief reference to some economic and social rights, but a much more elaborated list of responsibilities, including obeying the laws and so forth. But now it gets more interesting. When you look at the activities, they included um, advocacy for your rights with local officials, so that um, if you, there are problems with the district meeting, um, their responsibilities in providing social services, that you should be active 
uh, you should protest and you should demand them. So a totally different frame for civic said, their human rights nowhere to be found at that time, really, in the national curriculum. And yet this looks a lot like human rights advocacy and activism. But in a context where, you know, it's a weak state, basically. It's very interesting. So, um, so it made me also think, looking at the Uganda example, uh, and its whole, you know, again, disposition looking for beneficial relationship with international partners. You know, it's sort of the vulnerability, again, of, I mean, the whole dis a vulnerability around their positionality, rule of law, global processes. And I think that's really telling. Again, lifting back to this question of global citizenship education, here you have a kind of a, a frame that UNESCO has presented, working assumptions of civic, civic citizenship education, all these indicators, but the positionality of countries, their views towards you know, governance, how human rights is showing up, if it shows up in a value system like, you know, leaf of Buddhism, or shows up as a problem, uh, as a way to address problems of receiving services, it's very, very, at the local level, quite, quite different. Um, I'm just gonna, Mongolia doesn't show us as, as much of a contrast, so I'm just gonna now wrap up with New Jersey. So, um, I looked at the New Jersey Social Studies Student Learning Standards, and wow, it was amazing. There was a lot of GCED concepts or objectives. First of all, it began by um, stating that students should be civic-minded, globally aware, and socially responsible. And they actually had a, a strand called Civics, Government, and Human Rights that runs through the whole um, social studies learning standards, oriented towards responsible citizenship. There is no mention of international financial institutions or transnational corporations, which I do find interesting. I don't want to be you know, over-interpreting that. It's just a fact, but it's very interesting. Lots of emphasis on technology in the digital age. So again, it, it's not a, it's exclusively a critical consciousness approach, uh, nor a, a exclusively a kind of global competencies approach. Uh, but you did find this, uh, I think, in regards to global competencies. So we did find a lot there. I could tell you more about what was there, but it was, um, again, very much a contrast. And so these three case examples I wanted to share with you from a human rights lens to show, again, how the local context will be so defining in terms of how human rights is integrated or not, how it's showing up, and also how that lifts up to our wider question of global citizenship education to what degree, moving forward, we're going to see UNESCO promoting or countries responding to this more a kind of a consciousness, a critical consciousness approach to global citizenship education versus a more competencies-based approach, which is going to be much more, you know, how do you effectively navigate your, your personal careers or, you know, your country in regards to international processes of globalization. So, so that's what I wanted to share with you. Mostly food for thought. I'm planning to do a bit more research on GCED and, um, and and, it's, um, and how it's showing up in curriculum. But I guess I'll stop there and invite your questions and comments on, on what I've, I've shared. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, we have some time for question and answer. So and we do have a few people online. OK. Um, they've been having a little difficulty in communicating. So I'll be going back and forth between email okay. and here. So I'll turn it over to the floor first for questions, comments. Yeah. I guess um, my question is, uh, how do you see these countries' reaction towards uh, global powers such as the United States and England uh, choosing leadership and policies that are less global conscious, looking outward and more looking inward into their um, into their own issues? Like, how how do you see that as affecting their their education moving forward? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, if putting, I'm going to go back to the indicator framework. Think about um, UNESCO's position. They have, um, they want to promote global citizenship education. Um, they're working with countries that already have traditions around how they carry out civics education, for example. Um, countries also have very different traditions in regards to sort of thinking critically about their own political and cultural phenomena, let alone the North. So I think there's a potential that a very superficial layer of globalization gets put on. Like you keep up the way in which, for example, human rights is subsumed within Buddhism in Cambodia. Again, I may be critical here only because I know that you could have much more in human rights education. And it doesn't lead to any kind of critique even of 
Buddhism, nor does it even take into account that there are other kinds of religious systems and value systems that are actively in, in Cambodia. So in regards to countries that aren't part of the safety of the global north, we want to use that phrase, I think you end up, you know, just maybe with a thin layer, um, pretend, you know, if it's, it's already subsumed somehow within, you know, if you've got a predisposition towards like a heavy socialization model in terms of what's a good citizen, then I don't see a critical perspective coming necessarily, which is really a problem, you know, if we think of GCED and all that it can offer, like these. Um, the UN is always there, but now in terms of the global north, I think an interesting question will be to what degree countries like the UK or states in the US will actually take a critical perspective towards international processes that benefit the global north, basically, international financial institutions and so forth. And I think it just remains to be seen. I mean, the question, of course, is to what degree there is global education. So it's how you define global citizenship education, to what degree you even find it now. And then if there's any kind of shift, is it, is it really a deep one or is it, is it a thin one? So, I mean, it's hard to say. Global citizenship education, part of the initiative came from support from South Korea. A lot of the funding came early on. They hosted um, important um, gatherings, um, are still very involved with um, doing, like the study that was carried out, the 10 country studies partly financed from South Korea. And yet I'm not, we, I didn't look at what South Korea is doing, but I'd be very interested to know to what degree they're themselves engaging more in the global processes critically, thinking about it critically versus just thinking more about a local values orientation. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but you I'd love for what, what, what's your thinking about this? I'm not sure yet. I'm waiting to see what our um, current government does, because we, 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 we've said a lot, but we haven't actually implemented a lot of uh, change yet, so. You mean the U.S.? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and the National Standards, the National Council for Social Studies, I think, has very aspirational and very sort of critical mm -hmm. um, perspectives in regards to global issues. Yeah. So I think that the support for, for, I mean, those frames for social studies teachers are there. To what degree they end up in state standards, I guess depends on the state context, right? Exactly. And yeah. I'm from New Jersey, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. That's great. And that seemed to be good. No, the New Jersey one, I, I mean, I wasn't really, I wasn't involved in this myself, but through the Human Rights Educators Network, I know we, I had colleagues who were, and it seemed like there was interest in the governor's office, and then also even in Massachusetts, where I used to live, where we were at that time active in trying to get human rights education out there, there was a political lobby that was focusing on genocide and Holocaust education, we could attach to that. So how it shows up in state standards also very much, uh, I think, can be explained in part by, you know, individual political leadership or blocks and, and you know, legislators, uh, NGOs that are active. I know uh, for Human Rights Educators USA, they're looking at state standards, for example, as they're coming up for renewal and giving inputs, like doing that in Massachusetts now. For global substantive education, I don't know who the advocates are for that in the United States, you know? I, because, and, and it's, it's really a challenge. There are traditionally, of course, teachers and higher education professors, but also, I suppose, some teachers who would consider they were doing global education, maybe as part of social studies or language, second language learning, I mean, or even the humanities. I can imagine that there are some teachers self-identifying. And there are, of course, very strong NGOs like Global Nomads and World Learning that are really, really active in global citizenship education and has, have historically been so. How, they're, how much they're trying to influ influence state standards here in the U.S., I don't know. But would, 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 would that come from like the Department of Education or Department of Education? The well, States? I can answer and that. Where, I mean, yeah. where, how does, how does that get infused yeah. into the curriculum? Yeah. So I can speak the standards as you're saying. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I, I, can't, I can speak to that from my own experiences working in HRE in the U.S. Um, there was, um, during the Obama administration, there was uh, an office that did basically international education and was interested in global citizenship education. There were a few people in that office. They were the ones that were most receptive to the human rights framework because you know, they were thinking more internationally. I do not think that office 
is there anymore at ESA. Um, but, and, but they also had sort of a limited role. They basically helped to validate global citizenship education. Um, and I think they were working through, I mean, there are other, other executive office um, personnel that could have influenced. But um, otherwise, it's working through, for example, like I said, the National Council for Social Studies, so a professional association for teachers. I'm sure there are other ones related to civics or language learning that might have had a global um, spin to it. But otherwise, it's yeah, state level. What influences what happens at the state level? A lot of it is sort of local. I don't remember hearing that there was a direct link between, say, what was happening in um, the Obama administration at the executive level, the Department of Ed, and what was happening at the state level. But I suppose there's some validation. There must the chiefs, you know, the the governors' association, the chief councils of governors, CCSS. I mean, there might be avenues where they were promoting it, but um, soft policies, maybe. Yeah. Go ahead. If you have more, please tell me. Yeah. No, 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 no. This, this is sort of I'm diverting the topic a little bit. Okay. That's okay. First, thank you for this great presentation. I think it's super interesting and really relevant. Oh, good. For students. So keep great. Keep it open. Yeah. This is sort of a comment question. So I do most of my work in rural China, and many of these concepts in China, rural or urban, yeah. are not really welcome by the government. And I would feel that it would very unlikely to see these in official standards, in official moral or political education yes. textbooks and guidelines. Yeah. And so I was just wondering about like, whether we are whether we feel that we're missing things by sort of focusing in on those particular areas when we look at standards and curriculum. When I think of some of my own experience in China, I think that there are acceptable ideas within the Chinese context, context where some of these ideas that new concepts that you're coming up with here come into play. So for yeah. example, gender parity, and then also like the environment. Like yes. environmental Other education, right. and also sort of girls being equal to boys, those are places where in the formal curriculum, people talk about rights, people talk about protests, people talk about action. Yeah. So I'm, wonder, I'm just wondering whether a wider sort of umbrella in thinking about where we look for some of these ideas, that in places where politics is very difficult, that we may not be seeing them in civics or social studies or... Oh um, yeah, no, I think those would definitely show up. Um, again, what is not evident from this indicator framework, for example, climate change issues, I know that environmental issues are really important in China, and that would be under global citizens of education has incorporated um, issues related to environment, ESD and environmental education. I focus a bit more on the human rights piece because that's my background. Um, and also, when you look at the values component, um, gender, of course, you had always interested in gender. So you, you find that it would be, it may, it's not explicit here, um, but you, know, you, you find it here and there. So, but this is a question that I can't answer, and it's a really important one. So when is it, when do you, what's a critical mass? Because the thing about GCED, as I understand it, is UNESCO is trying to get this holistic frame, right? So on the one hand, we can see these indicators as ways to identify basically, you know, like evidence that there's something related to GCED happening. At what point do we say that's GCED versus, you know, education about gender parity or um, education about you know, environmental protection, for example, right? So they're consistent, but is there, it's, you know, and this is, I think this is a kind of dilemma, right? Even with um, this particular study, for example, a lot of what they were looking for, you might consider tradi traditional civics education, say in the states, like active participation in your community. So what makes it, it what makes it GCED that there's a global dimension? So I think this is going to be. I mean, your China example is excellent, and it's going to be true, I think, for many, many countries. Also, the United States. So we learn about civil and political rights in the United States, but we don't learn about social, economic, cultural, or we don't lift it up to UN processes. We focus on constitutionalism. So. So it, it seems like understanding that dilemma is an important part of thinking about the next stage of promoting it, because promoting these types of, if we think about the yeah. sort of the praxis and pedagogy part of it, the transformational yes. piece, that it might be acceptable to have these transformational experiences in some part of the curriculum, but not in others, mm -hmm. and that that would vary by country, and the success would depend a little bit on understanding what will work in different types of Oh, I think that's very true. Yeah. I think also this kind of study that UNESCO organized early on would be interesting is to go back in five years to see if there is a difference. There may be some sense that there might be sort of movement. But no, and China is a really ex interesting example because I have understood that it's a very highly socializing 
environment in terms of say the values and so forth, and at the same time, you know, the environment, other things are happening. Human rights education is actually required now in Chinese law schools, and they're doing a human rights education for prosecutors. So even there, and the language is being used. So it's very interesting that you find these sort of it's very complex. You know. Well, I think we see a lot of this in the, in the, in the regular schools. You see a lot of these activities like okay, it's okay and acceptable when the kids are like under ten, like age 10, 11, and then we see a big shift. Yeah. power and sort of dynamics in the classroom. So, it is so what do you think will happen in China? What would your be prediction? Let's say that China wants to show progress and global citizens of education. We know that's a wide frame. What do you think might happen? Well, one, I'm not convinced that they feel like they need to show progress. I feel like they, <laughs> and I think historically, if we look at other sort of global trends, like say, for example, like mental health programs, right? We, uh -huh. see, the, we see the Chinese taking sort of the rhetoric from like, the world organization and transforming it into a way that it works with an with our existing yes. sort of goals that the Chinese state has for China, right? So yeah. um, we see some conversations about multiculturalism and diversity, but we also see that aligned with the idea that schools in China are really making everyone more Chinese, right? So yes. I think I'm going to throw something out of that too. So we have, we've had several graduate students for their master's thesis capstone look at how global indicators map onto state indicators or national indicators into particular curriculum into actually how they themselves teach the curriculum. Nice. And one of the examples we did um, was South Korea, which has been part of this. And so had all the kind of right language yeah. and national policies and programs, teachers have been trained. So what the student did was looked at how graduates of these schools that had had access to it thought about their positionality in the world afterwards. And what they understood, according to this very small research project, was that South Korea was engaged in all of this, but it hadn't translated into a personal level. So they saw themselves as Korean and therefore engaged, but not as individuals outside of the South Korea. So that, I think this idea too of the individual versus who you these multiple identities, which part of your identity becomes the actor as opposed to the learner? It's kind of an interesting question. And this was for the, the educators who are subsequently going to be teaching. Yes. So did they see themselves as kind of transmitting that ideas versus the They saw the responsibility as South Koreans to support South Korea in being globally engaged, on taking on gender Let's issues, see. on taking on um, uh, civic rights issues, climate change, but, but not themselves them. personally actually recycling things, That's for example. Very interesting. Yeah. So it's kind of a patriotic duty, sort of. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So I don't know how that, if that China would have a very similar, like certain ages are more likely to be the actors versus other ages don't act, or certain parts of society become actors on behalf of everybody else. Very interesting. We also had a student in New Jersey look at New Jersey curriculum from the same framework, okay. but her role as a teacher in a school that was um, predominantly immigrant students, but also had a large number of immigrant teachers born and living outside the U.S. before becoming teachers in the U.S. And they found a lot of integration to these global ideas into their own practices that teachers were not even aware of. So the pedagogical practice didn't really match the the state standards, they actually went far beyond it because of who the teachers were and how they were interpreting it. Yeah. No, of course, the, 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 the distinction between intended and the <coughs> curriculum, implemented, achieved, yeah. fascinating yeah. ones. This was more um, because of the nature of the work itself, only allowed me to look at intended curriculum, but insofar as the measurement is an issue, mm -hmm. you know, it seemed yeah. interesting, and even with a small sample, to sort of explore a bit further. So, I mean, it raises so many more questions. Yeah. So what, so what is next? And what, what is UNESCO doing next with this research? What, and then what are you doing next with the research? Okay, so, well, I think that UNESCO, uh, and I, I don't know, uh, I'm not privy to what they're planning to do in response to the 10th country study. I do know that the work that I did with them was part of their preparation to begin to, do, to deliver technical assistance. Mm -hmm. So these particular countries that I looked at, Mongolia, you, Uganda and Cambodia are, you know, they were receptive to having um, their curriculum and other particular you know, laws, in um, one case textbook, looked at. And um, I presented the results in Geneva last fall. 
And um, the reports that I prepared, by the way, wasn't just an assessment, it also included recommendations for how they could strengthen global citizenship education in their systems. So my reports were a combination of, this is what I found with what I was given, because you know, very, you know I didn't look at everything. They had, uh, not everything was available in English, and this is what I would propose. So I already sort of gave them some suggestions, and um, IBE was going to sort of follow up with that. Um, in terms of other work, I've been asked, um, GC, uh, IBE asked me to actually develop their handbook for global citizenship education, uh, which I am very uh, always surprised by and also um, honored by, actually, because they know who I am. <laughs> I mean, I felt like, I'm not your thin global citizenship education person, so actually the great challenge I have this summer is to write their handbook for global citizenship education, which is supposed to be part of the technical assistance. And it's been a really interesting process to prepare for it um, because I did the research and I also taught a bit of this. I taught a class at Columbia last, this past semester, just ended last week, and a part of it was looking at global citizenship education in UNESCO, and I involved students in thinking critically about GCED. And I'm going to involve some students in helping me to work on the handbook this summer. And of course, it's not just the challenge of all that you've suggested, and there's so much more, because I know you in the room have, especially on this side, lots of experience with this. We know all the challenges of between the intended versus achieved, you know, implemented. But moreover, this whole challenge of developing a kind of universal um, framework of sorts, a guide that um, can be applied locally. This is sort of the dilemma that you want to, it's, we know that GCED will be incorporated somehow within existing frames. It's not going to be any radical change. It'll be a small step. What, what steps will be taken? Is it going to be mostly content oriented? Is it going to be looking at like interculturalism and then lifting it up to global? Um, if the really interesting things we think are engagement and action, then we're talking about a real different culture in the classroom, a different thinking about the purposes of schooling. Seems less likely. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, having worked in the human rights education field for a long time, I'm actually very pragmatic about these things. I believe in small steps. And um, so, I think, well, I, mean, I think it's very promising at the younger school levels. I mean, even that, the comment that you were making about human rights education and law schools in China. Yeah. I think I've worked in China for too long. <laughs> but yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I, I feel like that, educate, that piece yeah. is so that lawyers in China can write memos saying the U.S. is violating. Which is what they do. Like they say gun violence and poverty and not access to health care. Yeah, so, so they can yeah. understand the global discourse and say like we're not so bad. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. so I think doing thinking about this what it looks like um, in schools is yeah. so like much more hopeful and um, I think you're, what you said earlier though too is that China has to have some political interest in appearing to be um, or any country to appearing to be compliant with GCED. Um, again, in the U.S., that would be very dependent on the state, um, also the administration. So, um, but I, I actually, I, I guess I'm having faith in the small steps and um, hoping that, because I also have worked on other manuals and curriculum, and I very much have focused on the participatory and bottom-up approach, so at least I can have the mantra of participation and inclusion when thinking about frameworks of G that GCED and what it can offer. So the teachers are, you know, it's idealistic, but at least I'll put it out there. So I have some transversal themes, including gender, including um, participation in the rights-based approach, um, um, the local. So, so we'll see. I have, I have a frame in my head. I'll start <laughs> writing pretty soon. So any other comments? I really appreciated your questions and. Um, Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Thank you so, so much. And I'd love to have you back on the handbooks. Done.